Alright, so right off the bat, in the last video, I forgot to mention, I am not a lawyer, I am not offering and or giving legal advice, and I caught some flack because I didn't mention that. Might just wind up changing the name of my channel to Not Lawyer CRS. Anyway, today's topic is kind of like a part two of yesterday's video because there was some stuff in there people were asking. Topics we're going to cover, number one. How complicated is it running a gun shop? What's up with the FFL? Number two, affordable machine gun options. Number three, the ultimate goal, SOT. So let's start with number one. Now what we're going to do is just wipe everything off the table that's involved with every other small business. If you're going to start a small business, whether it's a gun shop or whatever, you will cover these things. So we're just going to move them off the table. We're just going to go straight into FFL. And like I said in the other video, ideally you want to open up a store doing something else. Anything besides guns, and then also sell guns. So you'll already have your small business going. So alright, you got your small business going, you want to attach an FFL. You're going to have to fill out a 12 page document. Um, just Google, what could you Google? FFL application, it'll come up. And you can print this off, and then you include your money, and you send it in. Now this can feel a bit overwhelming. Just bite the bullet and power through it. If you mess up, don't worry, they're not going to be like, BOOM! GET DOWN! And arrest people. No, they're going to send you the application back and be like, Hey, we noticed a mistake right here. This needs to be corrected before we can proceed forward. And I'm telling you this from experience. That's exactly what happens. Now some people will recommend you get a lawyer. If you have deep pockets, by all means, have a lawyer hold your hand through all of this. But this stuff is pretty simple. Most of it's self-explanatory. You should be able to go through it all by yourself without any legal advice. If you have any questions, you can always Google them. Typically, you can find the answer. Or you can even call your local ATF agency office. So, alright, you fill out the application. What's going to happen at this point is they're going to schedule a meeting with you. What they're going to do is come in, check out your storefront, make sure it's actually in a store. A storefront or you intend on selling firearms I believe you can also get an FFL out of your home and oh, how did they word it? it was something like three levels of security it's like we got a locked door we got a security system and we got a safe that's all three levels you don't have to do it in that order you can do different stuff but to the best of my understanding they're looking for three levels of security I could be wrong on this because this was years ago so just ask them. They'll tell you. They're not some secret company that's trying to prevent you from getting an FFL. If they don't give people FFLs, they don't have a job. They're trying to give you FFLs. Yes, some commie states like New York or California, it, things might be a little bit different. But okay, so they've come. Now what's going to happen? What they're going to do is just kind of look around. Because there's different things like in the state of Wisconsin. I don't know if this is a state law or federal but you have to be, what is it, 100 feet from a daycare or a school. Otherwise, every gun needs to leave in a locked case. We just skated by that. Otherwise, yeah, we have to sell a locked case to every single person that bought a gun. So we lucked out there. Now, let's say a daycare opens up across the street. Then, yeah, we got to change things. But anyway, he took his rangefinder. He clicked the school. We were just far enough away to where we skated by. Then he'll do question and answer. And that's your opportunity to just ask all these random questions you can think of. Don't panic if you forget to ask a question. He'll give you a card and he'll encourage you. He'll be like, hey, there's a learning curve. Feel free to call at any time. I'm here to help you. That is my job. I am here to help you get in business. I'm not here to take away FFLs. I'm here to give FFLs. I'm here to help you. And you'll wind up calling him probably like, once a month, your first year you're open, then your second year might drop to like every once every six months. By like year three or four, you won't even ever call them again. So all right, you now have your license. Congratulations. And remember, the license you want to pick is an 07. That's right here. This will cost you $150 every three years. You want an 07 because it removes a lot of restrictions. Now, Obama brought in... I don't even like talking about ITAR because it irritates me so bad. But basically when Obama brought in ITAR to shut down the 80% receivers, he made it to where even you 
It specifically says in there, does not just apply to FFLs, where even you, with anything more than a single stage reloading press in your basement, would have to register with ITAR. Obviously, that's completely ridiculous. So they included a whole bunch of ex exemptions. So as long as you're not basically... Because it broke down before this ITAR thing. Alright, if I brought in a gun to gunsmith, as long as I don't have two guns when I'm done, as long as there's only one gun, I'm good to go. If there's two guns, then okay, we need to register it as a second gun, blah 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 blah. After ITAR, it got to the point to where an FFL couldn't even do any sort of gunsmithing, installing a scope, anything whatsoever was completely illegal because you did not register with ITAR, which is something like $2,200 a year. But then they put in the exceptions and it's back to what it, what it should be. So your 07, that's your manufacturing. That's where you can build firearms. That's where you can do just about everything except for machine guns and silencers. So you got your 07, that gives you a little bit more freedom. Where was I going with this? I'm editing, I remember where I was going with that now. When you first get your FFL, just do your standard run-of-the-mill transfers because there's a little bit more involved when you want to do gunsmithing or online selling. Later, get into gunsmithing and for online selling, just buy a website because that'll allow you to do drop shipping and they handle all the tax crap. Because when I called about the tax crap, I called the FFL, well, I called the <clears throat> ATF and I was like, hey, do I charge tax if I'm selling a firearm online? They're like, we don't know. Uh, you got to call IRS. So I called IRS and I'm like, hey, do I charge tax when I'm selling a firearm online? They said yes. And I'm like, but I'm selling it to somebody that's tax exempt because a customer can't buy the firearm until they've completed the 4473. I'm selling it to a gun shop. All gun shops are tax exempt. So do I or do I not charge tax? And then the IRS guy was like, oh, I don't know. Uh, just do what you feels right. And when firearms come into the store through transfers, some people charge tax, some people don't. But if you set up like a website, like you just buy a website, it automatically does all that stuff for you so then you don't have to worry about it. So in the beginning, just go in, I'm just selling firearms, I'm not doing gunsmithing, I'm not doing any online transfers. Then once you get your feet wet and you start getting rolling, then add that stuff on. Anyway, you want your 07, that's the one you're going to want to get. So, all right, you, congratulations, you got your FFL. What's going to happen? Now you need to lock down distributors. They're a little bit hard to find out at first. I actually finally got a list from FN, which is the awesomest gun company in the world. And then Glock also gave me a list of where the distributors are. And so I contacted them, and then what I do is I send my FFL to them. Then they send me back a form, which is called a credit application. Because they're going to use e-checks to pay for the firearms. But, you know, what if your bank account bounces? So they're going to give you an assigned amount of credit. After you complete the form, then you give them the bank number you want them to draw out of. And they will take the e-checks through there. Then you'll have access to their website. You log in. You select the guns you want. At first, you're going to have some problems. One of the things you're going to want to avoid... I don't even need the whiteboard for that. Number one, avoid buying a firearm that just came out. Let it be out for at least three years. Number one, because then all everybody else can buy it, find the problems with it, and it can get fixed. Number two, when a firearm first comes out, it's a exponentially more expensive, even to you as an FFL dealer, than it is after it's been out for a couple of years. I've made this mistake. When the Beretta Pico first came out, I bought it. I spent, oh, I'd have to go back and look at the logbook, but I think it was like, $425 on it my cost $425 because I didn't know any better and it came out I'm like oh buy that thing it sat in the store forever before we sold it we wind up selling it at a loss like three months after I bought it for $425 on that same exact website it was like $199 so don't buy brand new firearms if a customer wants it yeah that that's a different story if it's already sold or if you're in a large enough shop to where it doesn't really matter. But just opening up, don't buy brand new firearms. So then after you get it set up with your distributor, you'll look at other distributors, you're going to price match constantly, and you're going to try to get the cheapest possible deals. They'll mark 
the firearms that are on sale. You buy those, you'll do okay. Now we started off just by putting some of our personal collection in here. I think I donated two or three guns, maybe four. My dad donated like two or three guns. And then we took the money from those guns and bought other guns and we just kept rolling it over and rolling it over and rolling it over until we had a store full. It doesn't actually take that long. So when you order your firearm, it's gonna come in a box. You're gonna be like, oh sweet, a box. Open this bad boy up. And inside is a firearm. The very first thing you want to do before anything else is log it in. Then you're going to assign it a stock number. Then you put the price tag on it and it goes on the shelf. That is the biggest thing with FFLs or selling firearms that you absolutely need to do. Every 4473 needs to be filled out correctly, and every firearm needs to be logged in and logged out correctly. Again, the ATF agency will tell you, hey, there's a learning curve. If you make a mistake, it's not that big of a deal, but we're here to try to end the mistakes and get you functioning properly. My other video, somebody had mistaken it as those defenses were against the government. No, those are against uh, liberal Mick Libin all the time that hires a lawyer to try to shut down my shop because he don't like firearms. That's what those defenses are for. The defense against the government, don't break the law. It's simple, that's the only defense. Just don't break the law. So all right, the firearm's been logged into the logbook. Customer likes the firearm, he wants to purchase it. Now, different states have different rules. There's partial contact, full contact, and no contact. What does that mean? A partial contact usually applies to pistols. That means the state wants to be involved on the pistol purchase. So instead of filling out your 4473, they'll give you some sort of different paperwork you're going to fill out, and you're going to talk to the state. And they're going to handle it. You still have to fill out a 4473, even if it is a partial contact. So you do your state paperwork, and then you also hand them this to fill out. And this gets filed with your state paperwork. Every state will have different rules. But no matter what, a 4473 needs to be filled out, period. Unless it's an SOT item, but that's a different topic altogether. Now your full contact state, that means the state wants to be involved in everything. So not only will they fill out a 4473, you'll have to also jump through some sort of state circus to get it done. And then there's a no contact state. Regardless what you're selling, all you're going to do is fill out your 4473. The front half is the customer. Then right there is a spot to sign in date. And then this is the information you're going to fill out. You got, what are you selling? Is it a handgun, long gun, or other? Click what it is. Then what, this needs to be filled out right here. What is this? 18A. What are they proving their identity with? And then it gives you little acronyms, acronyms for different things. You write it in there. Fill out the information right there. And then when you call it in, or you can do this on the internet, you will get a number. Then you write your name right there. Wait to see if it's a proceed, delay, or denial. There might be some other stuff on here, but I'm trying to rush this video up. But that's pretty much the main stuff. Then you're going to log the firearm in right there. How many did you sell? You write one. Write your FFL number, then you're going to print your name, sign your name, write what you are. Are you an owner, a clerk, whatever, and then date it. You want to have somebody audit what you've done. Ideally, you want to get somebody that likes looking over your shoulder and criticizing you when you do something wrong. This is where your wife comes in. So, all right, I have filled this out. The firearm has been transferred. Now I need to put this in a pile for a second set of eyes. As soon as I get a moment, I need to also log the firearm out of the book. Now this is going to go in a pile for a second set of eyes. This is where my dad comes in. Like He's a hardcore paperwork Nazi because he grew up in the time period of checks. I just hit the end of that period, but checks were so complicated back then. It, it doesn't sound complicated. You know, you just write what you got right there and how much you've spent and then everything should equal out. Well... Unfortunately, when you deposited your paycheck, the bank would hold it for four or five days. 
So if you went past this amount, whatever it is, within four or five days after depositing your check, they would hit you with an overdraft fee. But then they wouldn't tell you about it until you got your monthly statement. Sometimes you get your monthly statement if you didn't have a safety net built in there, either a maintenance fee or an overdraft fee can make you hundreds of dollars negative at the end of the month, which you wouldn't know about because you were negative. So then you kept writing out checks. The next thing you know, you're $3,000 negative at the bank. That's how things worked back then. The banks were set up to make you fail. Well, he grew up in that time period, so he's an extreme paperwork Nazi. So I put this on his computer. Then when he gets in, because I run... All right, so how I was saying was setting up the store with multiple people to spread the liability out so it's harder to take you down. The biggest problem with that is a lot of companies, when there's more than one person involved, they will butt heads and it'll ultimately tear down the company. How we set it up so that don't happen, I get here at like 6 in the morning. At about noon, my dad comes in. He works from noon to about 3. Then at 3, my stepmom comes in, so we never have to deal with each other. We all kind of do our own thing. We all kind of pay each other ourselves. Not a big deal. We separate. So anyways, my dad would come in at noon. He would look at this and he would go over it and hunt for a mistake. That's his job. When he tells me a mistake, it's important you do not take it personally. Do not take somebody pointing out your mistake as a personal attack. They're trying to help you. This is important. A lot of people take criticism as a personal attack and you cannot take it. You want him to try to find a mistake. So he'll go through, make sure everything's filled out on the customer side. Also write, does it actually say it on there? It, it doesn't say it on here, but so when the customer signs it right here, we'll have them add their phone number just in case we have to call them back in for some sort of reason in case there's some sort of mistake or something like that. So, okay. Customer did his part just fine. Goes to my section. Make sure I did everything just fine. Goes to a logbook. Okay, yep, it was checked in. It was checked out. Everything is fine. Then it gets filed. You want two sets of eyes on your paperwork. When we first opened, yeah, we weren't that busy, so we didn't have any mistakes. About a year after we were open, we were still during the gun panic, but we were actually able to get inventory like that, so I was just slanging inventory. I was on Facebook, people were just buying left and right. I was like, you want a gun, you want a gun, you want a gun, who wants a gun, here's a gun there, there's a gun there. And guns were just coming through the store so quickly because we were killing everybody's prices. Everybody was just marking shit up crazy, and we didn't. We were competitive with internet prices. So instead of having to wait, you know, a week or so for a gun transfer to come through, they could come here and pick up their shit that day. So we were slanging guns like crazy. Well, we were moving so many guns, I forget what had happened that we had went back. There was some sort of question on a 4473, or we were looking at up something to see what we had sold it for. Anyway, we go back to the logbook and we find a hole. That's bad. That's the kind of shit that'll get you shut down. Pulled out all of our 4473s, completely audited <coughs> the logbook, completely audited all the 4473s. I won't go into details how many we had found, but there were several. That's why we have the second set of eyes rule now. So we had fixed all the holes, got everything back up to date, and you'd think it'd be so easy. Like, how do you possibly have a hole in your record keeping? But when you get that busy, it just happens. Like, you're like, okay, I'll log them out. And for whatever reason, it gets filed without getting logged out. Or the gun comes in. Somehow, it doesn't get logged in. And that's why we put the stock number. Where is it? Right there. The stock number right on the ticket. Because you can't get a stock number without logging it in. So as long as you're filling out your tickets completely, it's got logged in. I think that's actually how we found the hole. We went to log out a firearm and we couldn't find it logged in anywhere. And it was like, oh my God, how did this happen? So yeah, now we audit things like damn near once a month, but sometimes once every two months. Audit your crap. Audit it over and over and over again. Have a second set of eyes come in. Yes, if you have a hole and the agent comes in, you're probably not going to lose your FFL. But he's going to be like, hey... 
that needs to stop happening. And then he's going to wind up coming in more to see if it happens anymore. Now, let's say you have a bunch of NFA items in the trunk of a car at an airport unattended. Yeah, that, that would be an instant loss of an FFL. But most of the mistakes, like, that, okay, that's a legitimate mistake. This needs to be corrected. It needs to never happen again. And now you're probably going to be on the ATF's watch list or radar or whatever the hell you want to call it. And you're going to start getting visits. So paperwork, 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 paperwork. This needs to be done correctly, completely. Audit yourself constantly. Just audit, 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 audit. If you can do that, if you grew up in the time period where checkbooks existed, you should be okay. And that's the real difference between any other small business <coughs> and an FFL shop is an FFL shop is you have that little bit of extra paperwork. Other than that, there's really no difference. Everything you would set up on a small business is the same exact crap you'd set up as an FFL shop. Sorry, that's your FFL. Affordable machine gun options. What do we got here? Well, you as a person have a couple of different options. One, you can buy a pre-1986 transferable machine gun. You're going to have to have some deep pockets. And there's other disadvantages to that too. Obama took away the trust. It used to be you would buy your pre-86 gun, you would set up a gun trust. What that is, is you're the trust holder. Now you can put trustees on there. So say you die or for some reason you become a felon, it would just go to a trustee. Not a big deal. The other option would be you buy it as yourself. Now, when you buy it as yourself, it's yours. So if anybody else gets caught with it, you're a felon, they're a felon. If you become a felon, now it's got to be destroyed because now there's a machine gun there that's unregistered. Unless, of course, you can get some sort of shop to take it on or a museum or a police station. It's probably going to get destroyed. Then... Now, the trust, now I haven't done one of these, so I might not be perfectly accurate, but from what I understand, the trust now needs to be renewed like every two years. Are you going to get a renewal letter in the mail? What if you accidentally miss that date? The trust is not recommended. Plus, everybody on the trust now needs to have their pictures taken, fingerprints, and you can't just put, because on the old trust, you just put a clause in there. Anybody over the age of 21 that can legally possess a firearm is on this trust. So if you're at a gun range or something and you're letting somebody shoot it and you go get a soda and for whatever reason an ATF agent shows up there, you don't both become felons because you put a clause right in your trust. Anybody over the age of 21, anybody that can legally own a firearm, can't do that with the trust now. Plus with the renewal thing, there's no point in doing a trust. You just buy it as yourself. So you gotta have deep pockets and you gotta be willing to do that. That's a pretty terrible option. Next option, you go with one of those binary or echo triggers. The, bar the binary triggers you can build yourself, if you even understand a little bit about firearm mechanics. So you can build it yourself for like 50 bucks, maybe $100. Or you can buy one that they make, but it's going to cost you $400. The worst part about these are is they can outrun the bolt carrier. So if you get too fast with the trigger, the hammer follows the bolt up. Now you have a dead trigger and you got to cycle in a new round. Don't recommend the binary triggers unless you're building one yourself. Then you got the echo triggers. That actually has a, uh, what would you call that? Because the hammer comes back and it locks on there so it won't let the hammer go until the bolt comes forward and releases the hammer. Functions the same way as like a normal full auto. Those are pretty cool. That, that gets my approval. You can't outrun the trigger because even if you outrun the bolt carrier it'll just slow you down mechanically so then you never run into a dead trigger awesome option we used to have bump stocks those are illegal now those were probably one of the best options because it gave you the it let you scratch your full auto itch and then you realized how full how stupid full auto was and then you never approached it again because it's useless aside for playing or unless you're in like some sort of squad formation then you can 
utilize a full auto, but as a single person, it's useless. So you got those. The echo trigger is not a bad option. Now your next option would be like, okay, I filled out my FFL. I'm now a class, uh, type 7 manufacturer. I attach an SOT. 500 bucks a year. You get your SOT. That allows you to sell silencers, manufacture machine guns. Selling the silencers will pay for your SOT. So you will get to manufacture machine guns for completely free. It's going to cost you the parts and labor. So what it would cost for a normal AR-15 is what you're getting machine guns for. This has a catch. You cannot take the machine guns home with you unless your FFL is at home. You cannot sell the machine guns to anyone but law enforcement officers. So if you want to let your SOT expire, you need to destroy those machine guns. But it's fine because AR-15 is like the most popular gun ever and the lower receiver can come right off. So if you register the lower receiver as a machine gun, from what I understand, again, I'm not a lawyer, you only need to destroy the lower receiver. You can keep the rest of the gun, but the lower receiver needs to be destroyed. Again, not a lawyer, not giving legal advice. So aside from the fact that you don't get to keep the machine gun, which whatever, I mean, they're just a toy anyway. An SOT, in my opinion, is the best option. So I hope this video helped you out a little bit. Feel free to ask any questions in the description down below. And maybe you'll inspire another video. If you'd like to check out any of my other videos, click on the links up here. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to help support the channel, got my Patreon. I also got affiliate links in the description down below. Don't forget to subscribe.